All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to all. Welcome to those joining us uh, on Facebook. Thank you to everyone joining us on Zoom. Uh, we're really excited to be welcoming you all here this evening. My name is Clara, and I am the Outreach Coordinator at NAMI NYC, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City, which is the host of today's event, Understanding Trauma and Psychosis, presented by Dr. Dolores Malaspina. Um, I'm going to take a moment very quickly to introduce NAMI NYC before I turn it over to our speaker so that uh, you all can learn a little bit more about um, who we are and what we do. Um, NAMI NYC is a grassroots mental health organization. Our mission is to provide support, education, and advocacy for individuals and families impacted by mental illness. So this means that we provide free classes and support groups and other programs such as this talk for both for folks that are dealing with mental health issues themselves and also people who are supporting family members, loved ones, friends, um, anyone who has somebody in their life who's dealing with a mental health issue that they wanna learn how to better support. Um, right now, all of our programs are running remotely via phone and video conferencing. You can find out more about all of our programs by going to our website at namiNYC.org or by calling our helpline. Um, our helpline number is 212-684-3264, and we're going to be dropping that in the chat as well so that folks can um, keep an eye on that. Um, and the last thing that I should mention about our programs is that all of our programs are peer led. So our programs for family members are facilitated by trained family members. Our programs for people dealing with mental health issues are facilitated and taught by people who themselves have dealt with mental health issues. So we're really trying to create a community where people can um, talk openly about what they've dealt with, what they've gone through and where uh, they can, everyone can learn from people, from other people who have been in a similar situation and, and who have dealt with similar issues. Um, we really uh, believe in that power of lived experience and um, we try to, to showcase that in all of our programs. Um, so with that, um, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, our speaker. Dr. Dolores Malaspina is uh, a professor of psychiatry, neuroscience, and genetics and genomics. Um, she's the vice chair for diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and is at the currently at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, she's on her third program uh, on on schizophrenia. She uh, started a schizophrenia program at NYU. Um, and was at Columbia for many years. Um, so she's got a wealth of experience that she is going to be sharing with us uh, this evening. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it right over to her. Um, the last thing I'm just gonna say really quickly is that um, we are gonna be holding all questions until the end, but do feel free. I'm gonna be keeping track of questions in the chat and please do feel free to put your questions in there and keep a discussion going there. Um, throughout the presentation. So Dr. Malaspina, it's all you. Well, thank you so much, Clara. And I'm so happy to say hello to some of my older NAMI friends and to welcome new ones. I realize it was during my residency 35 years ago that I gave my first NAMI talk. So this is indeed a, a delight and an honor. Um, NAMI is very, very close to my heart its mission and its work. So let's see how I advance my, oh, there we go. Okay, advancing. Uh, so how common is trauma? There's so many faces of trauma. This is trauma in our population, trauma that we're exposed to. I'm including some of the images following George's last week shooting of Asians. And I'm including the front of the grocery store in Colorado. Um, we hear about so much trauma. Many of us experience trauma. Um, let's talk about its possible relationship to psychosis. Well, how common is psychosis? One out of 33 people will have a psychotic episode in their lives. Um, for one or more percent, psychosis is chronic. It begins and continues. Many people develop psychosis in their late teens or early 20s, 
often after a fairly normal and successful um, childhood and adolescence. Once psychosis commences, we try hard to distinguish if it's bipolar or schizophrenia, but more and more we know that we simply treat each person as an individual and not as a diagnosis with the medicines that meet their domains of symptoms. We call it psychosis when it involves hallucinations, delusions, or disorganized speech and motor behavior. Hallucinations are auditory or olfactory or sensory experiences with the full weight and feeling of real sensory experiences. They're usually auditory hallucinations. And a delusion is just a fixed false idea. It's not open to counterexample or logic. People have stopped being able to process the information that could tell them the delusion is an incorrect belief. And then the thought disorder or incoherent speech or unusual motor behavior is the third symptom within psychosis. Now, could trauma increase the risk for psychosis? I will tell you that over 20 years ago, my fellow at the time, Cheryl Corcoran and I, were absolutely convinced it would be very important. We wrote this paper, which is by now very, very widely cited, and put a grant into NIH to explore the idea. And the reviewers said we were old fashioned, um, that they couldn't possibly be important. But sometimes you're just too far ahead of your time and you look old fashioned. Um, but now the question is, how common is stress in childhood? And by childhood, I mean before age 18. So to get to the bottom of this, there was a collaboration between the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and the clinical researchers at Kaiser Permanente. They enrolled 17,000 people who were getting care and did an interview about trauma, which you'll get to take too in a few minutes. And they identified the childhood traumas that had the greatest impact. This groundbreaking study followed these persons over time to see which childhood traumas predicted different disorders. What they found is that we have an epidemic of childhood trauma and it probably accounts for the greatest portion of chronic diseases in our population, um, which is astonishing. So what are the childhood experiences they identified? Some are abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, physical being that a parent, step-parent, an adult in the home pushed you, grabbed you, slapped you, threw something at you, or hit you so hard you had marks or were injured. Also sexual abuse, which is someone at least five years older than you who touches or fondles or attempts or achieves intercourse. That's sexual abuse. They also identified adversities in the household a child could be exposed to that also triggered trauma. The mother being treated violently or the stepmother um, pushed, slapped, hit, um, particularly um, threatened or hurt with a knife or a gun by the father or stepfather or boyfriend, just being exposed to that. What about a member of the household, a sibling, a parent, who's a problem drinker or an alcoholic? What about mental illness in the home? A mentally ill, depressed or otherwise psychotic person in the household, particularly someone who attempted suicide or someone in your home went to prison. These were the childhood household and abuse. The others were neglect, emotional neglect saying no one in your family helped you feel important or special. You didn't feel loved. People in your family didn't look out for you or feel close to you, nor did you consider your family a source of strength and support. Sometimes these kids just didn't want to go home. There's also physical neglect. No one to take care of you, protect you, take you to the doctor if you needed to go. You didn't always have enough to eat or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you where you wore dirty clothes. Now, how common could these have been? Well, of the 17,000 participants, one in four, that's 25%, experienced at least one of these 10 traumas 
one out of every 16 was exposed to four or more of these traumas. One out of five were sexually abused and over half of the women had experienced childhood abuse, violence or family strife. Astonishing. Here's the quiz. If you wanna count down on your fingers, one to 10, for yourself or someone you know, um, the quiz is 10 questions. Before your 18th birthday, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, put you down, humiliate you, or act in a way that you made afraid you could be physically hurt? Yes or no. Did a parent or other adult often or very often push you, grab you, slap you, or throw something at you so hard you were injured? So this was physical abuse and emotional abuse. Did a person five years older than you touch you, fondle you? Have you touched their body in a sexual way? Attempt to have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? And then, did you feel no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or looked out for you? Those are four of them. The other six, did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, no one to protect you, your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to a doctor? Were your parents separated or divorced? Was your mother or stepmother physically abused, assaulted, repeatedly hit? Did you live with a problem drinker or someone who used street drugs? Was a household member depressed or mentally ill? Or did a household member attempt suicide? Did a household member go to prison? Now, what you're going to see is that the scores on this test have powerful ability to predict your physical, psychological, and risk for chronic diseases. And too many of these can predict an early death. So the aging is not just in your brain, it's in your whole body. And by the end of this talk, I hope you will understand how that happens. Now, the frequency of sexual abuse has been looked at many times since this. Um, all children, 25 to 33% of girls, 42 had some sexual abuse before age 18, 9% suffered genital assault. For native Indian girls, native American girls, it was almost 80% had sexual abuse. We don't really know much about males. We think it's very high, but males don't report it and are, are not wanting to answer these questions often. But 20% of those with abuse will have a serious adult mental disorder. Um, what if we looked at some snapshots? Like if we looked at teenagers who were being treated for substance abuse, 66% of them had childhood trauma. 75 of the females, 75%. They are teenagers with alcohol and drug problems. They have tenfold more physical abuse, six to 12 here, and 18 to 21 times, 20 times more likely to have been sexually abused. And if someone's sexually abused, almost all of them have also had physical abuse. Let me start to show you a few that let you understand that the actual number of these predicts the impact on your body's physiology. So we can compare how many people smoke who've had none of these events. Then we can look at smoking, and this is in the 17,000 cohort for those with one, two, three, four, five, six or more of those items. And you see the risk for smoking climb steadily. Smoking is powerfully predicted by early trauma. Injected IV drugs, same thing. More trauma, more risk. We call it dose response when for every increase in the trauma or other measure, you see the risk going higher and higher and higher. So less than a tenth of a percent of people with no trauma use IV drugs, but three and a half percent of those with six or more traumas, right? That's called the dose effect. And that tells you how likely it is that you are looking at the right risk factor. That dose effect carries a lot of information. 
What about lifetime history of depression? We're breaking it apart by sex because women have so much more depression than men. But look, once you look at the trauma, trauma is really a very big factor for men with depression, as well as for women with depression. Women with four or more of those risk factors, half of them will have major depression. It's astonishing. Um, my experience is those depressions are just as treatable as the ones that seem to come out of the blue. But let's see if we can understand where they're coming from. Here's one that's really important, it's hallucinations. So hallucinations are often refractory when we treat schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And then they'll call that a refractory psychosis. Um, my experience in this data shows that hallucinations that persist after medication treatment are often tied to childhood trauma. Likewise, suicide, likewise, alcoholism. These have impressed you already, no doubt that childhood abuse is important and crucial to adult health. Here's the score that tells us about mortality, your chance of death. So for people who scored six or more, they had a 20 year reduction in lifespan. We also often wonder about people who seem to die more readily from certain exposures or conditions. And this is telling you that a lifetime of trauma will increase someone's risk of death. Um, we think that builds on how childhood experiences disrupt the development of the brain. And then because of that, the kids or the young adults have some cognitive or emotional or social issues. Sometimes they have high health risk behaviors, maybe as subtle as being a couch potato um, or maybe using drugs. Um, but these health behaviors start further influencing their health. Risks for diseases go up and then early death. So this is a major important thing. I pulled this slide to just mention to you at least microaggressions. A lot of people don't understand what's meant by microaggressions. We're hearing a lot of them now as we try to understand how racism can damage someone else. You know, so here is from a wonderful talk um, by the associate director at the University of Richmond, just some models posing with signs. No, where are you really from? Um, or why do you sound white? Um, and others. Um, these kinds of comments make people have a stress response. They can be damaging. Likewise, bullying. Sometimes I'll see someone and not understand their pathology until I go back and ask if they were bullied. Right now with the internet, we have to even be so much more careful. We have to stop bullying um, because this also is wear and tear on the body and brain. Now, let me tell you about psychosis, right? We've told you about a lot of other conditions. So suppose we start with large groups of people who have psychosis and then we assess them for their childhood trauma. Basically, every study that does it finds a tripling of the risk for psychosis when there was trauma exposure. Whether they look in a single study, whether somebody combines the results from 25 studies, um, but notice your risk of anxiety also is greatly elevated by that childhood trauma. Um, also in schizophrenia cases and psychotic bipolar, um, we find that among all the different factors predicting schizophrenia risk, including all the biological and genetic and others, two of the five are adult stress and childhood adversity. And that was a, a tough rating to make. Look at the power that carries. Sexual abuse, 90% of women with schizophrenia have at least one childhood trauma. Half of them had four or more. Um, also, as I told you, it's predicting suicide and hallucinations. Another way to do a study is to start with the young people, babies ideally, it's called prospective, and follow them forward and see the impact of trauma. Um, one study combined 
18 of those studies um, and found they could guess what percent of the entire risk for schizophrenia in my whole sample could just be explained by abuse. They found a third. A third of the risk for schizophrenia could be parcelated into, some, into this type of abuse. I mean, that stands with family history, which is much lower. And a lot of my work has focused on paternal age, which I find is about 25%. But here's another powerful risk factor. Another big study found risk increased by 2.87. You can uh, allow me to call that tripling or three. Um, and another very big study in a whole population of people at their first episode of psychosis, two to four. A study that I did of everyone born in Jerusalem from 1964 to 1976 found low occupational status and living in a poor residence um, significantly predicted schizophrenia risk. And it was separate from family history and paternal age. Now, other evidence shows that they add up. So a childhood trauma plus a recent trauma all of those can mount together. Another study um, done in Africa in a completely different rural population did find the same thing. Um, for the South African Sosa people, um, schizophrenia was also 2.4, threefold higher for those with cumulative stress. So it's, it's not just America, it's worldwide. This is a risk factor for schizophrenia. Next question, what's stress? You know, well, here's these kids graduating. That's exciting. That's gotta be positive stress, but they all got through lots of difficult stress, right? They all had stressful times, but in the end, they managed that stress. They were successful. Here's one that just breaks my heart. On the first day of preschool, you know, you can look at that little girl um, and that's really stressful, but we know that's okay. She's going to be fine. That type of stress isn't going to damage her. You might break her dad's heart for a couple of hours. Um, and unless we already have a severe mental illness, a couple of parking notices shouldn't cause us a long-term stress, but they can. A big stress in adults is bullying at work, which I've focused on for some recent talks. It's a terrible workplace exposure to be bullied at work. Now, our stress response system didn't evolve for any of these things. It evolved for that saber-toothed tiger. It evolved. So when that saber-toothed tiger started stepping towards us, we could do a bunch of things inside our body that gave us the energy and the oxygen to get the heck out of there, right? Um, and it also let us remember if we were scared enough exactly where we were and what happened. That's why a lot of us have a really clear memory for a severe trauma. It's almost like a picture postcard memory of the day of the trauma. So that is what we'll call a bad trauma. This is a slide by Joe Ledoux from NYU, which I really love because I have had the experience. You're walking in the woods, a little hiking and not thinking of much and you look down suddenly and you're about to step on a snake. And if you're like me, you go, ah! you know, you really have that reaction. But you know, it's a part of your brain that's before you've even registered it. Your amygdala, your, your stress warning system has seen that, that snake, it already had you starting to react. But then your thinking brain kicks in right after that. And you see, it's not a snake, it's got little branches on it. Oh, it's only a stick, right? But all of that has happened right away. You've been programmed to see all that. And if it was a snake, you would start activating your body to get out of there. And if you escaped the snake, that would have been positive stress. There was a, something to overcome and you needed your heart rate to increase. You needed more sugar in your bloodstream. Your immune system got activated in case that thing bit you. Um, and all of that made you learn. So you also had growth in your brain. So some stress is really important 
things that may seem stressful, it's important for a child to master. They might not wanna to go to school the day of that test, but if they do, they'll learn it's not that bad. If you let them avoid things, then they avoid more and more things. So being exposed to stresses you can master makes your brain healthier. But what if there's a stress you can't manage? What if it's a toxic stress? Well, that increased output of your heart will cause your blood pressures to slowly go up and lead to heart disease. And for short-term stress, your sugar goes up so you can manage it. But if you can't meet that stress, your high blood sugar stays there and you develop insulin resistance and that triggers later diabetes. And your immune system is good for a short stress, but for a long one, your immune system goes haywire. You can get more infections and other things we'll talk about. And most concerningly, that stress you can't manage leads to lasting damage in your brain, particularly in a part of your brain that does memory and context called your hippocampus and your prefrontal cortex. These are the areas most consistently abnormal in the brain for people who have schizophrenia. So toxic stress is indeed bad. Now, when I talk about stress, for those of you with a little biology, you may know I'm talking about the stress axis. And sometimes we'll call that the HPA for our hippocampal pituitary adrenal cortex. So that amygdala that saw, maybe it's a snake, starts activating your brain and your hypothalamus um, activates your pituitary and your pituitary activates the adrenal and cortisol, that stress hormone, pours out into your blood. Um, and that helps you do whatever you have to do. But if you can't turn that stress off, then your hippocampus, which I've shown in this picture, slowly gets more and more damaged. And in schizophrenia, the damage seems to begin in the anterior part. In prodromal cases, through a studies that I started at Columbia while I was there, we showed that that abnormality of the hippocampus is predicting the seriousness of your psychosis, and it's predicting who in the prodrome is going to develop psychotic symptoms. So this deregulation is really important, not only for the whole structure, but for the itty bitty cells. So I have over here on this side, trust me, that's a brain cell. We call that a neuron. And the neurons are pretty important. They connect to other brain cells. They put all the information together so we can make good decisions. Remember, a stress we can meet is a good thing but a stress we can't meet leads to this excess of stress hormones. Now, what you need to know is the master brain chemical for brain growth and brain health, that master chemical. That's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, if you love to jog, you are increasing your BDNF. Some people I've treated for depression never had depression until they broke their foot and couldn't run anymore. So running is one way that increases that BDNF. And it's also the target for most antidepressants. Um, so when you have high stress hormones, they turn off BDNF. Because remember the example of the, the attacking um, saber-toothed tiger, you didn't want your brain to be busy making brain cells those few minutes. You wanted all your energy to help you get the heck out of there. Um, and if you are still stressed, those stress hormones over time are gonna drive down that BDNF and that's gonna damage the brain because it's gonna lead to the death of the brain cells. And without BDNF, the connections get weaker and weaker. But we can do a couple things to get out of this hard cycle. One is sometimes psychotherapy alone can help somebody. They can reframe in their brain, hey, it's not that stressful. You know, if I don't get asked to the prom or some kids at school don't like me. Um, there's a lot of other things that are more stressful. So we can use therapies to get people to think differently, like cognitive behavioral therapy, and that can help a lot. 
um, but so can the right medications um, and ECT. And then add an exercise. I'll show you a study being done by David Kimmy in a bit that is enrolling patients to have them exercise and then look at their BDNF. Um, but that treatment drives down the stress hormones, increases the BDNF, and lets your brain recover. So even if stress has been toxic, early intervention can really be so crucial and helpful, right? So we're thinking about intervention now, not just when someone starts showing symptoms, but for young people who've had a terrible amount of trauma. Now here's that hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse. I couldn't resist drawing the hippocampus as a seahorse. Decreased by stress, increased by exercise. I will tell you Fred Gage's group in California showed that if you just put a running wheel in a mouse or rat's cage, it will double the size of its hippocampus and then showed the same effect in humans. So maybe if we have a stress, we evolved to run away from the saber-toothed tiger. Maybe that's why running is so helpful. I've tried to get some of my patients when they're stressed to stop watching SVU and get out and exercise. You know, just a, an alternative. This is the way to really interrupt that stress response. Now, thinking of before age 18, that brings us way back because we also have nine months of pregnancy before age 18. And it turns out that exposures of the mom in pregnancy also add to those other traumas you can be exposed to. So trauma of the mother, um, it changes of course, when she's traumatized, she makes that whole hippocampal pituitary adrenal axis act up and releases cortisol in early pregnancy, that cortisol can cross over the placenta and affect the baby in early pregnancy. So why does that happen? Well, evolution means it to be a good thing for us. Evolution probably figures, well, if mom is that stressed, let's have the baby be born soon. So based on that signal, of stress to the pregnant mom, and these are exorbitant stress, not going to work or missing the bus, but exorbitant stresses, war, attack, other extreme stressors. So what happens is the baby gets programmed by the mother's stress. That's called fetal programming. And even though it causes all the diseases that we call chronic disease, it probably evolved to keep humans alive. So this process tells us that the fetus is not developing from a blueprint of mom and dad. Instead, the fetus is constantly exposed to, to the maternal milieu of the mother um, during pregnancy and is receiving many, many signals about how to wire up the brain. Um, back in 2008 and then in 2013, when I was um, running my group called Inspires at NYU, um, we were looking at this data in the Jerusalem cohort I told you about. And during the time of our data collection, the Six Day War occurred. So we were able to look at gestation, pregnancy, month by month by month. And then, although we didn't know the names of any of those individuals, we worked with the Ministry of the Interior of Israel and they crossed all of that data with their psychiatric case data. And we could see which people developed severe depression or bipolar and which people developed schizophrenia. It got a lot of coverage. I have a picture here from the Jerusalem Post. It was a story that was widely picked up. Um, it was an early one, it's been replicated many, many times, but it's mine, so I show you that one. Um, and here's what we found. These are called sliding averages. And if you look, the female ones are the brown ones, and it shows you their gestational age from beginning to 40 weeks with that war occurring. And what you see is for those exposed in that third month, 
the risk was more than tripled. For women to have schizophrenia, it was not a male effect. We can wonder about that, but I will tell you another thing we know is that a male fetus has a much higher risk of being spontaneously aborted. And it's also possible that the males who were adversely affected were pregnancies that were lost. Um, but we do see this high risk for schizophrenia in month two. And for the meaning of time, I'm not gonna show you the bipolar data, but it's also female bipolar. And it's also one month later for the bipolar, it's that extreme trauma in the third month. I've identified a number of people over time whose husband, women whose husband was lost at that time or had other exposures. People have looked at famine, um, a whole array of pregnancy stressors. And it is this early pregnancy time that is the risk and more so for the female. So what else adds into that? In our Jerusalem study, we lifted out sex, as I show you, and it's four times more likely to affect the females. But then we said, how can we get a handle on how stressed these moms were? Well, neighborhood by neighborhood, we know in Jerusalem which buildings took shelling. And we separated out the residence codes and we saw that those who lived in the buildings that took shelling were 33 fold more likely to develop schizophrenia than the others. Um, and then we start seeing some protective factors, which I want you to know too. We see that moms who were educated more than eight years were able to protect their infants. So being born in that way, but having a mom with education and resources, and I assume these reflect stressors of a family, um, or if mom had the highest social status, they were four times less likely. I flipped them here to show you how much higher the risk was for moms without education or the lowest stress. But I want you to remember that high nurture and experiences after birth can undo and offset some of this trauma. Um, my dear sister-in-law um, takes in babies whose moms put them up for adoption before the adoption is finalized. She gets them from the hospital and she does very high nurture, um, you know, really to provide that protection from babies who might, want to, might not want to have been um, birthed. So here is that protective effect. Now, let me tell you a little more about what's going on in there. Remember I told you that evolution probably came up with this pattern because we see the same pattern in all rodents and in all mammals, that if there's a severe stress in early pregnancy, certain things happen. One is they're more likely to be born early, that's preterm birth, um, two is they're more likely to have a low birth weight. And the preterm birth can be just a week or two. It doesn't have to be, you know, meeting some threshold. As they grow up, they're far more sensitive to stress. They have increased stress response, smaller muscle mass, because they want to expend less energy. For humans, this set of characteristics increases their risk later for hypertension, high lipids, obesity, and diabetes. So here are these babies that might be born small and might stay scrawny through their teens, but then all of a sudden will start gaining weight, right? And so what we understand now increasingly is that if a mom is going to be stressed, a mom of any species, the signaling is she may not be safe carrying the baby to term. So the pregnancy ending slightly earlier, um, maybe it's not great for the offspring, but at least the offspring is likely to survive and mom too. And these other things that we call the metabolic syndrome and are the most common chronic causes of diseases, this hypertension, cardiovascular disease, these are meant to help out, we think. So having high blood pressure will protect that little offspring should that saber-toothed tiger bite it. Um, increased lipids will protect that offspring from a famine. 
Um, all those lipids that give us obesity, particularly around our middles, if we've been stressed, evolution thinks is gonna be a little bit of a buffer and insulin resistance that'll keep your sugar up, which is good if you're ever pregnant because um, the fetus needs sugar and good for your brain because your brain needs sugar. So these things may all protect a baby whose mom is stressed, but they lead to diseases as well. Um, one of the ways they do that is called epigenetics. You probably all learned a little bit about genes, um, but genes don't tell the whole story. We know that. And we also have learned nature and nurture are not such different things. So we have our set of genes. Let's call that scenario A, no trauma. Those genes um, get copied and the copies make the proteins that you need. The way the stressors affect the body is all these little red dots are basically stop signals. We call them methyl groups. They get put on to the DNA and then you can't copy it and you can't make the protein. So we can control how much of the protein from a gene gets made by just um, looking at that protein and how many of these methyl groups are on it. We, we are getting closer and closer to being able to identify some of the heavily methylated regions that might be important for psychiatric diseases. And some of our drugs already work in that way by changing gene expression. Now, that was a lot of information, I know. Um, but, but during the pregnancy, when the mom's hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, that stress axis, when that gets turned on, if it's turned on a lot in the early pregnancy, it means the baby will be stress sensitive the rest of its life, unless there's an intervention. So a baby will be more sensitive to stress, might not see it for a few years, but it's important to make that connection and understand the sequence of events. When you have a sensitized stress system, then you can't have what normally happens. Really for healthy stress, your brain sees it. It makes the CRH, which is called the master stress hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone. And it goes down to pituitary, up in your brain and it releases ACTH. And that's the ones that go to the adrenal. Everything's fine. You've met the stress and it all just turns off the hypothalamus. That's the normal healthy loop. Shut it down, shut it down. But some people can't shut it down. Some people, the least little thing, and they're stressed for hours or days. Other people have a stressor and they're resilient. They just think, oh, I'll deal with it tomorrow. They kind of push it off to the side. They don't let a stress damage or take them over as much. More and more, we teach people mindfulness. We teach people meditation. We teach people how to be present and escape from just that trauma memory that goes round and round and round. Um, but that round and round experience of trauma is because your feedback loop isn't working here. Now, as I said, high nurture is good. Even in mice, we can take the newborn baby mice, which need to be licked. So if you're raising mice, <laughs> make sure the moms had time to lick them. Um, so if you, you have like some moms that differ among the mice. So someone is a scientist might identify a mouse who licks her babies an awful lot and a mouse who doesn't lick her babies. And then they'll take a whole group of newborn mice and they'll put some with the high licking mom and some with the mom who doesn't lick them very much. And what they see is the mice with the low licking moms, um, they will have smaller hippocampi and be more stress sensitive and not do as well in the cognitive tests, especially if they've been stressed ahead of time. I mean, in other primates, we see this licking and grooming, right? Um, so us humans, we're very social. We need the social signals. You know, one of the problems might be that all of this trauma gives someone some social anxiety and they socially withdraw. We need to help them reconnect 
with their peers and their family so they can have the benefit of the social support. Now, one of the things that I focus on now is how events of pregnancy and events of life can interfere with all the bacteria, viruses, fungi, and all the little other things that live in your gut, in your mouth, and on your skin. That's called the microbiome. It turns out for the last 3 million years, the most beneficial bacteria to us humans have been evolving right along with us humans. When a baby is born, the mom has concentrated in her vagina the bacteria that will be best for the baby. And during that vaginal birth, those bacteria get in the nose and mouth and seed the gut of the developing infant. That first seeding of bacteria, viruses, fungi that evolved with us, that does the best job of organizing the brain. So our brain is partly organized by these bacteria. They also control the development of our immune system. So these are really important, right? We spend so much time thinking about genetics, but I'm telling you about things that may have an even bigger role, right? And explain what we call the, the hidden genetics, um, since we don't have many genes at all. They maybe account for 6% of cases, but we have to look at these other factors. So the gut bacteria, if you're born by C-section, you'll get more bacteria from the skin. Although increasingly people are doing studies where C-section babies would have wiping of the mouth and nose with something that swabbed the vagina to get the healthiest bacteria. Um, some moms just think that's yucky, they just don't understand enough. Um, but that may be a way to really protect babies. The other thing that's a problem is all the antibiotics that are given. So think of all the antibiotics we don't need, right? Every mom gets their kid to the pediatrician, they want the antibiotics, gosh darn it. <laughs> they made the appointment, they got the kid there and the kid has a fever and they're not leaving without their antibiotic. Well, my daughter, the pediatrician, daily has to explain all of this to people because what we see is we have epidemics of obesity and a whole host of diseases and autism and earlier and earlier onset of schizophrenia and depression all around the time we started using all of these antibiotics. Right now, certainly if you have an infection, you need an antibiotic. But if you don't need an antibiotic, you shouldn't be taking it. Um, I deal with loads and loads of people who are sure that all of their symptoms are from a parasite or an infection. And they've had courses of antibiotics and they want more, even though there's no positive test or an infection. And I have to start teaching them about how their gut microbiome might be giving them all their current problems because they've had way too many antibiotics. So the study that I'm doing now is for people who have mental illness, depression or bipolar, but no psychosis. And then for people with psychosis, and then for healthy people who have um, no mental illness, um, I'm imaging their brain to find inflammation and I'm getting samples of their stool and their oral bacteria um, and I'm looking for a bacterial signature that may show a way that we could adjust the gut microbiome to treat diseases, right? That could be so, so important. And um, we also look at the circulating inflammatory molecules called the cytokines and then test their cognition and test their symptoms. And it won't surprise you, I also look at their early trauma because early trauma can also disrupt the gut bacteria, just like mom's trauma during the pregnancy. It may influence which bacteria she puts in her vagina. I'm working with a dear colleague, Julie Spicer right now. She has a grant in that we're revising to test if trauma to the mother or the father is influencing preterm birth through those bacteria in the vagina. 
So it's a whole new forefront to see how trauma might influence the brain. Now, let me point out to you some really amazing circulating cells we have um, in our of peripheral blood, we call them macrophages or monocytes. And those are little cells that go there when there's an infection or a cut. Um, but we also have some of that cell line that get into the brain during development. They live in the brain and we call those the microglia. Those are the most important cells probably for schizophrenia and for Alzheimer's. We were focusing on the neurons, the neurons, the neurons, but it's these little guys that probably damage and cause the loss of neurons. So you can't have a healthy brain without these microglia. You know, think of them as like hanging out watching things and it's everything's okay. They don't do very much during brain development though. They go and do the wiring, and fix the synapses. So that's pretty important. Um, and if you have a problem in your brain or some debris, you know, they'll go in there and they'll clean it out and get rid of it. Um, they're just checking things out. If they see a problem, you see they're like activated um, and they can release some toxins. Like if they think there's something going on in there, um, maybe there's not, but maybe they've gotten a signal by mistake that there's something going on in there. They'll start damaging and can destroy connections in the brain. A leading theory now for schizophrenia is the excess loss of brain connections between adolescence and adulthood that we see for people who develop schizophrenia might be because these little microglia have gotten activated. Some of the genes for schizophrenia that are associated with schizophrenia, one of them is this major histocompatibility loci, an HLA gene, a variant that makes these microglia attack healthy synapses. So some of the loss of connections that emerges as psychosis is probably these activated microglia. Um, and when they're activated, they just chomp, 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 um, really do a lot of damage. And that's where the action is as well right now for Alzheimer's disease. Now, no one will be quizzed on this. I'm just tying it all together with a nice slide made by my colleague, Fairly Birgink. Um, who runs our um, reproductive clinic uh, for psychiatric disorders at Mount Sinai. And basically things come together. The adverse childhood experiences, the prenatal adversity, some genes for inflammation, they all come together and they probably trigger these microglia. They can have their first hit in the developing brain with this activation, making the brain vulnerable. Then a second hit could be childhood adversity or stress, and then they're activated. Um, and then we damage the brain. Other ways can be autoimmunity. So people with schizophrenia are far more likely than other people to have a family or history of autoimmune disorders thyroid disorders, lupus, um, and even themselves to have more autoimmune diseases. Well, the target of the autoimmunity can also be the brain. Look at the difference in stigma between having an autoimmune thyroid disease and having schizophrenia. And now start to see the overlapping similarities, right? You must get rid of the stigma. Other things can be this gut dysbiosis I mentioned or infection. These can all prime it. And these little monocytes in the periphery, they can get activated and then they release these inflammatory molecules called cytokines or the breakdown products of tryptophan. Um, so let me also put together this idea that trauma doesn't only have to be during pregnancy um, or childhood. We have something called intergenerational trauma. If mom or dad have had excessive trauma, we're identifying ways that that trauma through that epigenetic thing I told you about gets put onto the genes and it doesn't always get washed off. 
So we can have trauma from another generation influencing the baby's predisposition. We also have the history of the whole population where certain gene variants may have come up that make you more likely to attack your brain. Then we've got prenatal trauma, also giving you those epigenetic changes and programming. Then we have what happens during childhood, postnatal trauma. Then we've got the setup where there's a risk for schizophrenia. How do we get that Band-Aid? How do we get rid of that risk for psychosis that's been so magnified by all of these exposures? If the psychosis is already there, what do we do about it? One crucial thing is that we have trauma-focused treatment. Now, psychiatrists used to not even want to ask a patient about their trauma. They used to go, I don't want to trigger them. The horse is out of the barn. That was a big mistake we made. Because if you don't know about the trauma, you can't address the trauma. Um, so you need to know about the trauma. For some people, we can use a form of psychotherapy um, derived from what was discovered by Edna Foa. She's one of the leaders in, in treatments for trauma, where we can slowly have someone remember some pieces of the trauma in a controlled way. A trauma that happened to you, when you think about it or you're triggered, you get all of that emotion. But each time you talk about it in therapy, you re-remember it differently. And eventually, you can take the trauma away from the memory through these re-experiencing in safe guided ways. So you can treat the trauma and the post-traumatic stress disorder together. And the vast majority of our patients have had trauma. We need trauma-focused care. You communicate with compassion. You provide holistic care. Um, you have diversity. Very often you have peer support groups. Um, it's different than show up and get a pill, right? Um, so I wanna tell you just about a few programs that we have at Mount Sinai. Um, one developed by Cheryl Corcoran, who started out with me at um, Columbia as my fellow when we had this idea that stress was the most important thing. And then she ran the COPE Clinic and developed it, which is a center for prodromal research at Columbia New York State Psychiatric Institute and is now at Mount Sinai running this wonderful program called Coping with Unique Experiences, Q, instead of high risk, she thought, um, where people can be referred who might be at risk for a clinical diagnostic evaluation without cost, um, be referred for uh, medication management, psychoeducation. There's a program for CBT and opportunities to participate in research. If you're interested in the Q program, um, you can write Shana, S-H-Y-N-N-A, Herrera, H-E-R-R-E-R-A, and we're all at mssm.edu. Um, you could email me, it's dolores.malaspina at mssm.edu to connect with them, or Rachel Jesperson. Suddenly, um, currently they're doing an amazing study um, where they have individual uh, language samples. And they send those language samples to IBM. It's someone just speaking and they feed it into the supercomputer Watson. And Watson can tell nine times out of 10 if the person is at high risk for psychosis. And that's in five different languages now. So that's the language study. And they're also doing a study um, looking at um, biological markers, which is really exciting. A lot of people are focusing now on whether antibodies to the NMDA receptor or other antibodies might be causing their psychosis. This is a study that involves a very safe, painless spinal tap, but it takes some of the fluid circulating around your brain to see if you have those antibodies. So it's recruiting people with psychosis, again, to Shana or Rachel, that's the brain development study. There's another um, fantastic study called Prospect run by Yulia Landa. Um, and this is to, again, prevent um, symptoms and psychosis 
through education and cognitive work. It's for young people age 12 to 20 who might be having early symptoms for them and for their families. It's special evaluations, it's CBT groups, um, support for the person and family and mentorship, individual group and family therapy, and help with school or employment. This is funded by SAMHSA, which is US government agency, um, to really try to have an effective intervention. And if you're wondering if you or someone qualifies, um, we have this little, are you worried that others are watching you, talking about you or want to hurt you? Or are you feeling confused about what's real and what's not real? Are you withdrawing from family and friends? Noticing changes in the way things look or sound. And again, you can write to Rachel about this program, or you could call her um, at 212-585-4641. I also want to tell you about an amazing study by David Kimmy, who also trained with me in a fellowship at Columbia and is now in the psychosis program um, at Sinai. Um, and David is really interested in the fact that people with psychosis don't exercise. So he's doing a multi-site NIH funded study um, where individuals either exercise either in an aerobic way or by stretching. Um, and each is overseen from their own home um, by a certified exercise counselor. And they do it three times a week for 12 weeks. And David is looking to see if it changes the amount of that VDNF that can fix the brain, right? So this is the exercise study. Um, again, like all of these funded by NIH, um, and you can write Dr. Kimmy, david.kimmy at mssm.edu or call him at 212-585-4656. And I already told you about my study, looking at the gut-brain axis, and I'm recruiting people 18 to 55 who either have schizophrenia with psychosis or an affective disorder without psychosis or no mental illness, but want to contribute to science. Um, and we're testing very comprehensively um, inflammation uh, in the body, cognition, all of the things that I mentioned. And for each of these studies, people make between $300 and $700 when they complete these. Um, so, you know, I'll finish up by saying how delighted I am um, to be at Mount Sinai to run the psychosis division called Critical Connections. I just wanna give a shout out to NIA, NIMH, the Mathers Foundation, the Brain Behavior Foundation, NARSAD, uh, for launching my career um, and the training for my junior investigators. Um, I did have five NARSADs um, over many, many years, um, which has really meant everything to pushing my work forward, my training grants. And there's just a little photo I found today and I put there of Renee Kahn, the really exceptional chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai and himself a schizophrenia researcher who's happy to have other schizophrenia researchers around. So I'm gonna scroll really quickly back to the first slide and I'll leave it there while we talk about questions. Anyone who can follow it in reverse, you're here. <laughs> so thank you all, I've appreciated your attention. I'm sorry for speaking too quickly at times. Clara? Thank you so much uh, again. Uh, so now we're gonna go into the Q&A portion of the presentation. So I understand some folks have to go, but if you can, please stick around. Um, so we had had a number of, of questions throughout the presentation. I think I got them all, but if I didn't, please feel free to ask your question again in the chat. Um, I wanna start by asking, there were a couple of variations on this question, but um, what are the, what, what do you see as the best way to mitigate the effects of those ACEs or of, of those childhood traumas um, that, that we discussed? So trauma-informed therapy um, is available without you developing a major mental illness. So one is high trauma, is high nurture at any age. 
right? To try to, you have to, you can't treat the trauma while someone is still experiencing it. So when you know someone's experiencing a lot of trauma, you have to do what you can within your power to put an end to it. Um, for people who are older, I think trauma-informed care is very, very important. A lot of times that early trauma gets hidden behind a particularly intelligent or resourceful young person, but it can catch up on you later. It can catch up psychiatrically as we talked about, but for other people it catches up physiologically. That inflammation isn't only happening in your brain. Um, matter of fact, I think at the same time, your brain is getting that inflammation. Um, so is so are your blood vessels that already on first episode, people have diabetes, hypertension, even at young ages. So the metabolic disorders are proceeding at the same pace as the brain damage. It's just that the psychiatric symptoms are so much more noticeable that that becomes the treatment they get first. I will also say that the metabolic disorders are decreased by being on medication. Too many people are so concerned that the medications might cause weight gain. Being psychotic is much more damaging. Also, we think that the medications, antipsychotics and antidepressants are anti-inflammatory in the brain in some ways. You know, we always say like block dopamine. Well, what does that mean? It means at the cellular level, there's something going on that's likely curtailing inflammation and particularly maybe with clozapine may do it more so. Um, so for young people, intervene, stop the trauma. For people who've had trauma and are pushing it away, better to deal with it when you're young, you can recover from it. You can become resilient. You have a big focus on fostering resilience. And if you're in treatment already, whatever age you are, deal with the trauma. It doesn't have to trigger you forever. And recognize how you can traumatize other people, right? Through microaggressions, through bullying, through being snappy and nasty when someone pushes in front of you in the grocery line. Um, understand that these mass murders that are so horrible in America, although nowhere else, they affect not just the people in the community, but all of us who have to see it and hear about it. So we need less trauma, that's for sure. But the rates of childhood trauma are pretty similar in a lot of places and the interventions need to be the same. Did that answer it? I also will say, I think all people, um, would benefit from certain vitamins. <laughs> I, I myself recommend a good, multi, a good multivitamin with minerals because often people will take one mineral or another, like too much magnesium will throw off something else. So good multivitamin with mineral. If you're willing to take two, there are some vitamins developed for the eyes. The eye is an outgrowth of the brain. So vitamins developed to protect the eyes also protect the brain. And we also have evidence that keeping your vitamin D really much higher than they tell you when they do your vitamin D level is really important. Higher levels of vitamin D do protect the brain. And there's evidence they minimize the impact of COVID. Um, and last but not least is fish oil or krill oil. So I think all of those are helpful as well, Clara. Awesome. Um, so uh, two, two well, uh, one question that was um, re-asked, uh, but since you mentioned kind of uh, trauma appearing later in life, um, what do you, um, how, how would you characterize the differences between um, late emerging uh, psychosis um, in someone who's 40 or 50 or 60 years old and suddenly is developing these issues as distinct from you know, a young adult who's developing these issues. Yeah. So those late life psychoses are much more common in women um, than men, the late life onsets. Um, for males or females, it can be psychotic depression. Um, but for women after menopause, their body and brain changes. And we have a grant in now from my group um, because we have a theory about what's going on. Um, so after menopause, something happens to the woman's brain, which caused a whole new emergence of psychosis at that point. Now, as to later and earlier trauma, I have an example, there was a terrible fire 
when I was a young clinician and many firemen died in this fire. And of those who survived but were on scene, one of them developed very, very severe PTSD. And at the same time, I was treating some Vietnam vets who had severe PTSD still, and it was the anniversary of something with D-Day. And suddenly I also had some like World War II veterans. Um, and what I started seeing in all of these people who had these problems, it wasn't just their later life stress, they each also had the childhood trauma. So we start to develop a model where the traumas are additive. Maybe without the childhood trauma, they would have been more resilient. Thank you. Um, also, just going off of your point about, um, you know, determining uh, the way that, about, about trauma sort of that can manifest um, as negative behavior towards others. Um, what do you, oops, sorry, I'm trying to find the question. Um, uh, how, how can you identify childhood trauma manifesting in adulthood versus narcissism? And what are the statistics uh, regarding childhood trauma manifesting in adulthood with the victim themselves then becoming abusive? And, you know, in addition to that, is there a way to help someone realize that they're being abusive and change their behavior? I'm a psychiatrist. I believe people can always get better <laughs> and there are always interventions. It's very, very few people um, who will be violent and aggressive to people they don't even know. Um, but when psychosis is not treated, rarely, but sometimes someone can get violent. That can be driven um, by fears or delusions. Um, but I, I do think that people who have had high trauma, not only are they more likely to be the victims of domestic abuse, they're more likely to be abusers. Um, so there's a couple of more specific questions. Um, can you talk about uh, some of the therapy techniques that might be appropriate for, particularly for group therapy for adults who may have experienced childhood trauma um, and how, so I'll leave that. And then there's a second question about finding resources that are trauma-informed. Yeah, so if you, even if you went to some uh, Psychology Today, for example, runs a really good website with all the psychologists, for example, or psychiatrists in different regions, I've noticed more and more people will say they do trauma-informed care. I think it's useful to ask them about their training. Um, but as someone can tolerate, there's a stance towards someone who's been highly traumatized. Um, there's more of a collaborative, uh, trusting relationship. And in the setting, as it's safe, often there's a specific trauma that's focused on. And that specific trauma gets brought up tiny bit by tiny bit until some part of the trauma can be recalled without trauma and without an emotional reaction. And it's through that way you peel the horrible emotional state off of it. I, I see a lot of young um, women, some young men, um, but who cut or who dissociate, who might like shut down inside and maybe pick their skin or veg out or feel frozen. Many of them have had early trauma and I do a type of care where I encourage them, you know, to, to break through that trauma. You know, first of all, that they understand that that ability to dissociate when you're stressed, usually people could only do that if they had early trauma. So that later dissociation is other evidence of trauma that people should identify and deal with. And can you talk about um, how someone might go about finding a clinician who's trained to deal with trauma? You ask them. Um, at our program at Sorry. <laughs> um, Morningside, NASA Mount Sinai Morningside, they are getting that ACE test on every single person in the inpatient and outpatient. They are becoming a trauma-informed place of care. And let's hope more and more um, care places, mental health treatment places step up to that. But also 
our medical doctors, our pediatricians. I mean, I will say that my daughter, the pediatrician, she gets this on every one of the kids she sees. So finally, medicine is recognizing that trauma has consequences. Um, uh, one question about a single episode versus uh, multiple episodes of, of psychosis. Does a single episode mean that more episodes are likely or um, is it possible to just have a single occurrence of, uh, of psychosis after sustained um, trauma or abuse? Yeah, so um, the way we, we assess the risk of continuing psychosis is by how long it lasted. So we have some that are very brief, we'll call them brief reactive psychosis that go away quite rapidly. Um, but then we have some psychoses that will last a month. They're in a little different category, but we won't call it schizophrenia unless, first of all, the psychosis is not explained by anything else, but we need six months of psychosis or treated psychosis. Um, and then we think there's a, it's unlikely to go away when it's lasted six months. I usually, when people recover from a first psychosis, which I, you do see um, psychotic or uh, with or without mood symptoms, I really beg them to stay on even a low dose of an antipsychotic for two years. It just interferes with another one coming back. People, when they've recovered and feel well, don't wanna think they still need the medicine. Right, so that's what's really important. If you can block the psychosis, you can try to get them back to school, re-engaged, right? If someone says, I'm fine, I don't need it, then the psychoses start coming and coming. Um, and we think sometimes that kindles them and makes them worse. So we really want the evidence shows, um, you know, even if we can slowly drop the dose to not go off of it. Um, for additional resources, are there any books that you would particularly recommend to learn more about these topics? Oh my, I didn't come prepared for that one. <laughs> <laughs> or specifically about psychosis. Yeah, um, yeah, I, uh, let's see, I can think of something good I just did, but it's in a scientific journal <laughs> where we thought of all the things that should be considered when you treat psychosis. But, but I'll get back to you, Clara, with a list you can post. Okay, um, that I've, sounds great. There are, there are other times in my life when I would have rattled them off, but I've been too swamped lately to keep up with them. There are some great books. Absolutely. Um, a, uh, so there, was, there were a couple more questions. Um, oh, so this, this might you'd be, I think, elaborating on a point that you already made, but a question here is, would trauma-focused treatments like prolonged exposure, uh, et cetera, be contraindicated for folks with a primary psychotic disorder? My training generally told me not to go deeply into trauma, so I'm curious about your take. Yeah, that was what I said, that psychiatrists and clinicians were trained not to go there with psychosis. So what we have is a lot of people with psychosis and terrible trauma. So we want to try to find the way um, to blend CBT for trauma with CBT for psychosis. I think we have to address the trauma. Um, I think the therapy should be much more nurturing, should have a different stance, should be more collaborative, um, and should gently find ways to address that trauma. But yeah, that's right. People would train not to even ask. That was why nobody understood, right? Until way too recently. How common trauma, how common trauma was in psychosis. Um, there's also a question on a slightly different topic. Can you address drug-induced psychosis? I'm not sure if that's outside of the realm of this yeah, well, topic. Anything, but... anything can be on the table. <laughs> um, so a number of substances can acutely cause psychosis. That includes street drugs and that includes prescribed drugs. Um, but the one I'm most worried about is cannabis. So cannabis, because it's being legalized, people are thinking it's safe. It's not safe for young people. Um, you know, when the brain is organizing, um, as I mentioned to you with the microglia carving things up and making a healthy brain, some of the chemical mediators of that are, are endogenous cannabinoids. So during 
adolescence to the late teens or early 20s, if you're smoking a lot of pot, you're interfering with your brain development. So the risk for schizophrenia is much, it's probably fourfold for our kids who smoke pot early in their teen years. And it doesn't go away when they stop. So Carol Caton many years ago did a study in all the New York City um, hospitals of people in the ER who had psychosis from a substance. And she followed them up 10 years later and only the ones who were psychotic from cannabis still had schizophrenia. So some people wanna say, oh no, it's just treating the early symptoms. The large amount of studies done over time make it very clear that these people were not all going to get schizophrenia anyway. And some of the Scandinavian countries, they've tried to calculate what proportion of psychosis in young people is due just to cannabis. And they're like 10%. So here's a very important thing you could do. And if you're a parent, don't be confused by thinking cannabis is safer than alcohol. In my practice, I've had three young people brought to me with new onset psychosis, whose dad said, you can smoke all the pot you want, but don't ever have a drink. Don't tell that to your kids. Tell them they can't have a drink and they can't smoke pot. Also cigarettes are a risk factor for a later schizophrenia that we're starting to understand too. We know that 80% of people with schizophrenia smoke cigarettes. They all started before the psychosis. Um, can you also talk about um, how, uh, how to distinguish the, um, rephrasing the question a little bit, but how to distinguish the trauma-informed approach from, uh, from the uh, sort of a blaming approach of, you know, blaming par parents uh, or, or guardians for um, the uh, mental health condition? That is such an important question and you asked it beautifully. You know, my sister has schizophrenia, which is how I became interested in this field. And at her onset, we had to go to all of these family meetings where basically, you know, they tried to say it was my mother's fault, you know, that there was a schizophrenogenic mother, um, which has absolutely been disproven. I came to be less upset about that era in American psychiatry, when I learned that it was actually a response to the Holocaust. So the Holocaust began, began um, with killing all mentally ill people in the Third Reich. It's why I don't like to use the word Asperger. A scientist, psychiatrist named Asperger went door to door to find the young people he thought would be mentally ill and they were also murdered. Um, so where did that, that idea come from, that terrible eugenics idea? that some people were lessered. And um, that actually began in America. It was an idea that came post-slavery called eugenics to justify um, some people being inferior to others. And it migrated to Europe where it was used against Jews and gypsies, but only after it was used against people with schizophrenia. So beginning in the US after World War II, the psychiatrist thought, but at least if we blame mothers, it can get better. And so that's what led into that horrible time because at that time they denied all the other factors. They just said mother was cold and spoke in a double blind. Well, that's different than this trauma, right? Blaming mothers for the way they phrase their language, which is what they did, is very, very different than these types of childhood traumas, right? Um, so this is not to be confused with blaming the mother, okay, everybody? As a matter of fact, in all the examples I showed you, it was the mother being hurt or blamed or abused or assaulted that was highly traumatic to the child. Thank you. Um, so I think, so there's a, a couple of, uh, Let's see. Um, I think we have about five minutes left. Um, so I'm trying to see if there are other questions um, that have not really been addressed. Um, 
Um, can you, oh, here's one. Um, can you talk about risk factors uh, for somebody um, living with bipolar disorder, developing psychosis during a manic episode versus having a manic episode without psychosis? Yeah, that's a really great question. Actually, a study we published, last, so part of my research was to propose and then show that the father's age is a major risk factor for psychosis, um, which operates independently of trauma and stress. And we did a study that showed, so one out of four people in who have bipolar will develop psychosis. So one study we did showed that people with bipolar psychosis were more likely to have an older father. So that was one of the factors. But I think all the risk factors we've talked about for psychosis and schizophrenia are probably also risk factors for psychosis and other conditions. Um, a lot of psychosis, you know, if somebody has bipolar or depression driving their psychosis, you really need to treat that other disorder. I'll say how surprised I am still by people who treat individuals with psychosis and don't realize that they have bipolar disease or that they have depression. Psychosis is kind of so compelling. It gets everybody's attention. And in general, clinicians are inadequate at deciding if that psychosis is part of another disorder. And so they just wanna treat it with antipsychotics, which don't really treat the other conditions that can go along with it. You know, there's a lot of ads about this or that antipsychotic, you know, being an antidepressant or a mood stabilizer. You know, in my experience, you really focus on the antidepressants when there's depression. Antidepressants directly target that BDNF we talked about. Antipsychotics do not. So we have different modalities of classes of medication that are targeting different aspects of brain functioning. And certainly everybody would love to be on one medicine except, and not three or four, but a lot of people with psychotic bipolar disease require several medicines and really good therapeutic alliance to stay perfectly well. Great. There's also um, a question about uh, diagnosing uh, schizophrenia in young people, um, whether uh, paranoid schizophrenia is a viable diagnosis for um, a young teenager of 15. Yeah, so absolutely there are 15 year olds and younger who do get schizophrenia. Um, I was on the DSM-5 committee and I know many people were fans of making attenuated psychosis its own disease. I was not in favor of it, I must tell you, because I thought then people would really do less of a good job picking up depression. So childhood depression and childhood mania, we have a lot of psychosis that doesn't predict a psychotic disease. So you have to do a very, very good job when you see psychosis in a child to make sure it's not depression um, or bipolar or another condition. Um, but that being said, yeah, you can see schizophrenia in a young person. In our prodromal center that I told you about, we start trying to do interventions with kids as young as 12 who might have occasional psychotic symptoms, but they're doing a good job at making sure it's not explained by a different psychiatric problem that might be treated in a different way. Um. Oh, uh, one more uh, interesting question. Um, uh, oh, there's a lot of a lot of people wanting wanting to. to I'm I'm so sorry. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of the questions. I just want to give that disclaimer because we are going to be wrapping up in just one more minute. Um, but uh, uh, but there were two. Now I, I will mention that when I've given all my other NAMI lectures in a room, as soon as we finish, there would be a very, very long line. We just can't do that on the internet. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Um, but I appreciate that you uh, shared your email address um, in the, the presentation and people can watch the video to get that um, in, if they really have a burning need to contact you. Um, so uh, yeah, two, two outstanding questions and then I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, there was one person uh, who had asked earlier, I do remember about um, chemical exposure and um, psychosis, particularly in the context of, of veterans. I think there's a, a, a role for chemical exposures and psychosis. 
and veterans, but also unborn children, um, prenatal exposures. We are all packed with chemicals. They are not good for us. Some of the nanoparticles probably can diffuse right through our body and brain. Um, so, you know, taking care of our health and the planet, absolutely crucial. And uh, the other outstanding question was about if hypervigilance can lead to psychosis or partial psychosis. Yeah, I think it's one of the, the pathways that gets wired in by trauma, right? Um, so even the animal models exposed to trauma and pregnancy are hypervigilant, you know, like check it out, check it out. Um, that may be a tendency to pay too much attention to irrelevant things. So I like to think of delusions as somebody trying to give meaning to something that is just a coincidence or irrelevant. And then after that, they can't take the meaning away. Like they become delusional. So yes, I think that's a, a vulnerability factor. Cool. Okay. Um, um, okay. So uh, I think um, we are we are a little bit past time. So unfortunately, we are going to need to wrap this up. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Melaspina, and, and thank you so much to our audience for attending for your wonderful questions. Um, again, if you need to, uh, if you want to refer back to any of the information um, in this presentation, the, uh, the recording will be available on our Facebook page, uh, NAMI NYC. Um, and uh, Dr. Melaspina, do you have any last uh, final um, thoughts to share. I just think we all need to lean toward high nurture. <laughs> we, we sorely need that for one another um, and it can have a major effect. Uh, so, and I thank all of you for caring about mental health, for being motivated enough to join and, and hear about these things. Um, thank you. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. Thank you. NYC. Thank you. And, and, I, and I understand, you know, some of the material that we discussed today may, be, may have been difficult for folks to, um, to, to listen to and to think about. Um, and so I, you know, do, do very much understand that. And I hope that um, anyone who's having a negative reaction um, is able to take care of themselves. We often refer folks to NYC Well, 888-NYC-WELL um, as a 24-7 line. You just need to get some get some feelings out um, because uh, this this can be difficult subject matter to um, go over. So uh, thank you all so much. And with that, we are going to end this presentation. Have a good evening, everyone. Be well. Stay Bye. safe. Take care. Thank you.